Hi, everybody. Dan Ullman, Mike Beer, the DRF race of the day for Thursday, April the 2nd, race number eight at Gulfstream Park. We're going five furlongs on the turf. It's an entry-level allowance race for fillies and mares. Our coverage is brought to you by the Ontario HBPA and their Own a Thoroughbred initiative. Make 2020 your year for excitement. Visit ownathoroughbred.ca for current ownership opportunities. Call the HBPA of Ontario's ownership specialist, Stacy Roberts, or visit ownathoroughbred.ca. Let's meet the field for Thursday's race of the day. Remember, you can download free formulator past performances for this race on the race of the day event page at drf.com. Access them, handicap along with us. For a five for a long turf sprint, Mike, there may not be a ton of pace in this race. The number two fall in Leaf, however, is very fast. She's expected to make the pace on the time form U.S. pace projector, and I do not disagree. Yeah, I agree that she's going to be up there on the lead. She's a fast horse, and it seems kind of one-way speed. Um, I, I'm surprised they had the seven as far back as she is. I think you're going to see Awesome Roar show a little speed in this race, and she's pretty fast when she wants to be. Let's talk a little bit about the number one, Smack, who scored last time out in a maiden special weight going five-eighths of a mile. She graduated in her eighth lifetime start. Smack was able to get a really nice trip in this race, Mike. She was able to get up close uh, to a moderate pace, and as they turn into the stretch, she takes a little bit of a bump, and she keeps right on going. Let's watch Smack finish this race off. Uh, I thought it was not the greatest field in the world. She did what she had to do. Yeah. The buyer speed figure came back very solid. And that's the thing you're going for if you're a Smack fan. She has run fast races. Time from US doesn't have her very close to the pace projector, so it might be a different trip against better horses. Yeah, true enough. I mean, she ran well in this race. Um, as you say, not a great field. She got a very soft trip um, and did what, did what uh, she had to do there. Won very easily at the end. I do appreciate the fact that she's probably a better sprinter than she is a router. Um, so cutting back last time, you know, probably really helped her. And she's, you know, she just makes a lot of sense in, the, in this race. Again, for a trainer in Christophe Clement, who's going really, really well right now. I got him at um, 10 for his last 21, Dan, over the last couple of weeks with a 551 ROI. And that's 8 for 16 on turf in that sample. So his horses are just really running. Um, I suspect that Smack will run well again in here. But I don't know if I would take too short a price on this horse. Well, she is eligible for a non-winners of two life, and she is facing horses that have won multiple races, including the speedy Fallen Leaf, who is a six-time winner. She hasn't run since November when she was fourth in a starter optional, although the winner of that race is a pretty nice horse. Came back to run third in the claiming crown dash with the 78 buyer, then won a $35,000 claimer with an 82 buyer, then was dead heated for second at that level with a 77 buyer. Fallen Leaf has speed. Can't knock speed going five on the turf, especially at a price. I agreed. I mean, I, I respect her early speed. This looks like it is her distance. And, you know, even though she's only six for 34 a lifetime, she's four for 11 since this trainer has taken over. Um, she's probably making the lead in this race. And she's just sort of an easy horse to make a case for. I don't love her in here, but she's easy to make a case for. Misbehave is the number three, very lightly raced. You can argue she has some upside potential. She exits, exits a race where the fifth place finisher returned to win at this level with an 81 buyer. She didn't break very well, and that is really a death sentence going five furlongs on the turf. That being said, I think she might end up being more of a synthetic horse at Woodbine over the summer and into the fall. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I guess, you know, I, I don't want to be too hard on her because it was a very long layoff last time. Um, it would have been nice to see her do some running there. Like she never picked her feet up in there and, and never, it just looked like maybe she really needed the race. I don't know, Dan, her only turf start last year, I thought was okay. It was a good field. She had a look at it in the stretch and then she got a little tired. She didn't run poorly at all. I, I suspect she'll run better in this race, um, but she's going to have to. Dixie and Candyland, the number four, is 9-2 to two on the morning line. If she stays at that price, I think she's a very strong play. I have a feeling that she's going to get bet based off the troubled trip she had last time out, going five-eighths of a mile. We'll show the stretch run of that race. Dixie and Candyland is going to run second, but really the stretch run doesn't tell all the story. Mike, tell the whole story. Yeah, you're still, she's on the rail right now, going to finish second to a very sharp winner um, in this race who got right to the front here. But this was a good effort because prior to the stretch run, she was just, you know, over behind horses, very strongly rated, and then had to steady, lost position, got shuffled all the way back around the turn, and then you saw the finish she put in. I mean, 
all in all, she actually ran really well in her first start off of a relatively long layoff. And she had run well sprinting on turf a couple of times last year, too. There's, I think there's just a lot to like about this horse. This is a very well-bred horse. Mike mentioned all the positives in here, and he's hoping that this horse stays close to that 9-2 to two morning line. Twice as magical as a horse that's making her first start of a lengthy layoff. We have not seen her since the end of September, where she won a maiden claiming race, defeating two next out winners. She did it on the lead. We'll watch it right now. She showed good speed in that spot. She's going to be facing some other strong speeds, though, off the layoff. This was a nice win for her. You saw her just spurt away from the field. The layoff is a concern. Yeah, it is. A six-year-old or a five-year-old with only six starts so far. She has run better in her three turf starts, um, and she does have speed, Dad, but there's speed to her inside, there's speed to her outside. This feels like a pretty tough spot for her. Tipple is the number six. We usually don't like these significant cutbacks in distance on the turf. She's cutting back from a mile race back to five. I think shorter is better for her. I think five is actually okay for her if she gets a strong pace at the right level. And I'm not sure she's a non-winner of one other than horse right now. She's been sort of stuck at the starter optional race, uh, starter allowance uh, ranks, pardon me. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I, I do agree with you, though. I like her turning back because she is, if nothing else, she's a closing sprinter. And when they finally turned her back last summer, um, I realized they were claiming races in New York, Dan, but she ran really well when she won those back-to-back -back starts at Belmont and Saratoga. I mean, big finishes from off the pace. And she actually ran well in her three turf sprints after that a couple of times badly compromised by slow paces. She was in good form sprinting on turf last year. She catches a pace in here, she's going to come running. Awesome Roar is the number seven, and I think she has to be respected simply because she's the most prolific winner in the field. She has won nine times in her life, and she is facing a group of horses, many of them which have only won once. Last time out, she was third, but I think if you just watch the race, Dixie and Candyland ran a far superior race than she did. Yeah, that's how I looked at it, too. Um, Dixie and Candyland doesn't have the back races that Awesome Roar does, but Dixie and Candyland certainly ran the better race last time. Um, I'll say this about Dixie and Candyland, and I don't love her in this race, Dan, but obviously she has the back races to contend. I think she's going to show more speed in here. She does have more speed than she showed last time. Um, and, you know, you just have to respect the fact that she's won so many races. I'm just not a huge fan of hers, and... Um, while she has nine wins, she's won six races in a row versus lower level claiming horses and hasn't really been that competitive. Not that she's won poorly when they've run her in allowance races in the interim surrounding those races. It worries me, um, but she can clearly win this race. The eight is Bentley's dream. Second off the layoff for Ian Wilkes has proven to be a strong angle over the years. And Bentley's dream just seemed a little bit flat. First time off the bench at Gulfstream Park. Catching a race where she just sort of ran around the track. She was bet that day like she could contend at 9-2. to two. The finish wasn't there. Her race two starts back, and her start at five furlongs at Arlington, way back in her second lifetime start, those figures are competitive with these. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, she did no running at all last time, but I feel like you almost have to take the position that she just needed the, uh, the race off the layoff, perhaps, because her turf sprints as a three-year-old were actually pretty good. Um, and she's 10 to 1 on the morning line. Those are all positive. Sayonara Baby, the nine, completes this field. She is a daughter of Munnings trying turf for the first time. Munnings wins 10% with first-time turf runners. The unraced dam has sold one turf winner from two turf starters. I look at this family, though, and I see a lot of dirt. Horses like Cotillion winner, Star Minister, Ohio Derby winner, Stellar Brush. I just wish there was more turf in here. Perhaps she can be a pace factor. I'm going to take a wait-and-see approach. I, I agree. I, I know she's going to be a price in here, Dan. I don't really want her trying turf for the first time against this field. Um, but she's run some pretty good races on dirt. Let's take a look at our top selections for Thursday's DRF race of the day. Smack has the figs. I think she's going to drift a little bit off that two to one morning line. I hope that she has enough speed to stay close. She was a pace presser last time out. She's facing perhaps stronger speed in here. But as Mike mentions, Clement can do no wrong right now. So I'm going one, four, eight, and seven. And Mike, you're going with Dixie in Candyland, the number four off that troubled trip. And I think if she can stay close to the pace, she's going to be firing hard in the lane. Yeah, that's how I looked at it, too. I, if she stays around that price, I think she's uh, very fair value against this field. She's supposed to keep getting better, and she's second off the layoff now. Um, I like her, and I'm going to use Tipple as well, Dan. I hope she catches some pace and comes running.
Four six one seven for Mike with a nice price tipple in second. One four eight seven for me. It's your Thursday DRF race of the day. It's the eighth at Gulfstream, and it has an approximate post time of four forty one Eastern. Good luck.